Good morning, Southside. Let's stand together and sing. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Buds of joy or my soul like a sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds have passed with my pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into Like a sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in that city I know Since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart I remain standing and sing the longer I serve. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life be controlled, since Yeah. 
I am not singing. No, I'm not. All right. Well, good morning, Southside. Good to have you with us this morning. It's a good day to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're glad that you're here. If you're watching by way of Facebook Live, uh, you, uh, we want to welcome you to our services today. We have probably somewhere between 15 and 20 people every week that uh, watch our services. And then usually during the week, you might have, find a few folks that uh, click on that. So uh, we're grateful for that avenue. Um, you got to watch social media sometimes, but that is an avenue that we can broadcast the gospel, so we're grateful to be able to do that. Miss Melinda uh, is leading our youth, and she has an announcement she wants to make uh, for us this morning. youth program is off to a great start, um, but we had something that we wanted to bring forward in front of um, everyone. Um, our youth is going to be going on a mission trip. Um, we're going to take, I think it's high school, so it's seventh grade and up, um, to Hazard, Kentucky um, over spring break week, which is April 3rd through the 6th. Um, we're going to be helping rebuild after the floods that happen. Um, so we're going to be doing repairs and things like that. Um, we are going to be doing a bake sale soon as a fundraiser. And then we're also going to be serving um, a spaghetti dinner on February 15th. Um, spaghetti, garlic bread, salad, all the things. Um, we are not going to put a price on that. We just ask that donations be provided. Everyone is invited, um, but that will go towards our youth. Um, for the mission trip. So um, we are very excited. Uh, we've had anywhere from five to 10 every time that we've met. So yeah, it's been great. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Please be in prayer for this ministry um, as we grow and as we are outreaching. Thank you all. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And just to add to that, you know, we're we're not a large church. We're not necessarily a small church, but, it, you know, even though we may be a small church, uh, and in one aspect, we've got a big heart, and, and uh, we want to support uh, our kids and our youth uh, as far as uh, what they're going to be doing. So we want to make an investment in, in their lives. So praise the Lord for that. Um, just a couple quick announcements. Uh, in the bulletin, there's a prayer list, and uh, I made a mistake on the prayer list. That is, uh, one of those is it's not Linda Taylor's mother. It is Linda Young's mother. So uh, if you make a note of that, and then also many of you may, may remember Edna Rayleigh. Uh, Edna, Edna Rayleigh uh, passed away yesterday about 12 o'clock. We'll be doing her funeral on Tuesday at 1 o'clock at Hatcher and Sadler uh, Funeral Home and then burial at uh, Memorial Gardens uh, here in, in Glasgow. So uh, just keep, uh, keep that in, in your prayer as well. Tonight starts our Experience of God study, and that will be at 5 o'clock uh, tonight. And uh, we do have one extra workbook. If you fail to get a workbook for this week, uh, we do have one extra one that you could purchase from Susie uh, Guthrie. And uh, she'll get that taken care of. Class starts at 5 o'clock, goes to about 6.30. Uh, so uh, you'll be here, and, and I believe that's going to be a good 12-week a good, uh, study uh, for us. There is uh, one announcement on the rolling announcements in the bulletin, and that is we're going to do a Christ or Christmas Easter cantata. An Easter cantata, we're going to do it on Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. Uh, but in February, we're going to begin practices. Uh, so if you want to be part of that choir... There's a sign-up list, uh, that way James will know how many uh, people to plan for, and sometime in February we'll start practicing to get ready for our Easter cantata uh, on Palm Sunday. All right, I'm not aware of any other announcements. Several of our folks who haven't had a chance to be here for a little while are back, and please welcome them uh, back to our services because of some illnesses and sicknesses, so praise the Lord for that. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer, and then we'll continue our worship service. Father, we love you, we praise you. Lord, we're thankful for today. We're thankful for today being the first day of the week, Sunday, the day that uh, you, were, uh, you rose from the grave, Lord, and we celebrate the resurrection every day of our life. And Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for uh, how you work in and among us, and we thank you for your work uh, through our church. We thank you for the ministries that you allow us to participate in uh, here at Southside. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless those ministries. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that you continue to allow us to serve you in our community and do what you command us to do. Now, Lord, we just want to continue to lift up the, the name of Jesus in our praise and also through the word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. There's a lot of... I said, Shabia, Unibu, Moma. 
You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them and doing a Bible story or going through a scripture. To us, it's, it's spending life with them. It's living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them, sharing the truth with them. come to the city from the villages, they immediately are looking at in the face of the reality that they are invisible in the city. So the women are out there begging on the streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them. They don't even acknowledge them. They don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access to the Embarrer people. And this project helps them provide jobs. And it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry and she's really a leader among the community. And we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We would go visit her every week and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for over three years. And finally, about two months ago, she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus. And we were able to baptize her in her community in front of the whole community. And she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so they can have enough information to follow Jesus. We just want to thank you all for giving to the Lottie Moon offering because without that we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We're able to focus on our ministry. We don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard. together and sing, life is worth the living because he lives. God sent his son, they called him
because he lives and in one day I'll cross the be seated and children may go to children's church at this time. <clears throat> Brother David and I get together every week to get our music together and he said he's going to be preaching a few Sundays on the goodness of God and I think there's a song I sang I guess sometime last year entitled Goodness of God. I think it goes along with this just I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my Good 
It's a blessing to work with James every week, isn't it? What a... Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to a very important passage of Scripture, a very familiar one. The very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3. We're going to be talking today on the topic of God's goodness to His church. God's goodness to His church. Now, this is going to be a little bit different uh, message or a little different passage of Scripture uh, to talk to you about God's goodness to His church because I believe uh, that God has a message to His church today and, and I believe His church that started many years ago is still going strong today. Uh, even though some of our churches may not be as strong as they ought to be, God's church is always strong uh, because He's still the head of the church and I believe that God loves His church and God wants the best for His church and God wants to bless His church and God wants His church to... Uh, uh, to have the goodness of God and the blessing of God on, on His church. And, and the way I look at it is if God loves His church, then we ought to love His church too. I'm uh, always doing research and reading and studying, and one of those studies that I discovered is, it's a pretty up-to-date study, is that the average attendance on a Sunday morning in any evangelical church in America today is 65. So 65 people, that's the average. You say, well, what does that mean? That's the median. That's the average. That means that some churches have a lot more than 65. There are only a handful of churches in our country that are considered mega churches. A mega church is a church that has 2,000 or more. They're, they're just sort of spotted around in different places in, in America. So many of those churches have more than 65. Many of those churches have less than 65. I know just in our three-county area in uh, Hart, Barron, and and uh, Metcalf County today that we've got a number of churches, Southern Baptist churches, that might have 20 or 30 in it today. Uh, but regardless if that church has 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, or that church has five, God loves His church. Now, is that good or bad that the average is 65? I don't know. But I do know, if I read my Bible correctly, that God wants His church to grow in multiple ways. One of those ways is numerically but primarily, God wants His church to grow spiritually. I agree with what one pastor said the other day, and I think we'll put this on the screen. Uh, this is a quote, and he said, and I quote, Healthy churches are always churches that are generous churches. Now, let me just explain that for just a moment. What is a generous church? Well, I jotted down a few things. These are not going to be on the screen, but generous churches are generous in their giving. Uh, they are free to give as far as what God would challenge them to give. Generous churches are free or generous and they're living. They want to live their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 16 and 17. Generous churches are generous in their helping. Uh, when there's a need in the community, when there's a need in the church, when there's a need uh, in the area, generous churches are always helping churches. Generous churches are generous in their reaching. Uh, they want to reach people for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And generous churches are also generous 
in what they can offer. You say, well, what do you mean what they can offer? What I'm talking about is not the programs that we are offering, but what I'm talking about is that we offer the greatest gift that can be known to mankind, and that is the Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we meet here today and we sing songs and we fellowship and and you hear a sermon from uh, your pastor today, we're not here because we're a social club. We're here because we're a church. We're here because God has commanded us to be here to fellowship and to present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I came across another quote the other day by a good friend of mine. Uh, He used to be friends with the great evangelist. The evangelist's name was uh, Hyman Appleman. And uh, Hyman Appleman warned 40 years ago, and we'll put this quote on the the screen. He warned 40 years ago of the inward focus of the so-called deeper life movement because that deeper life movement produced believers who knew a lot uh, but rarely led an unbeliever to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what is that quote actually speaking about? Back in the 80s, there was a movement called the seeker-sensitive movement. And the seeker-sensitive movement was all about myself. It was all about what I wanted. It's all about what the church can do for me. It's all about what the church can do for my family. And it became an inward focus instead of an outward focus. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is both. It is inwardly focused because the gospel wants to reach in your heart. Would you say amen to that? But it's also an outward focus because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go into how much of the world? All the world and teach the nations. Well, let's look at this passage of Scripture this morning uh, because I want us to look at and do some good, what, what we call good biblical homiletics, which means we're going to study this passage of Scripture. Let me just ask you a couple questions from this passage of Scripture. It won't be on the screen. Uh, question number one. Uh, Who is this letter written to? Well, it's given to us in verse number 14. It's written to the angel, the messenger, or the pastor of the church. Uh, Question number two would be, who is this letter written from? Uh, It's written to the church. It's written to uh, the messenger or the pastor. But who's it written from? Verse 14 tells us who it's from. It's from the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. It, It is from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then The question is, what is the letter about? What is this letter about? It is to the pastor or the messenger. It is from Christ, but it is about, look at verse 16, it is about being lukewarm. Let's begin in verse number 14 and read through verse 22 and discover what God wants to say to us this morning as we talk about God's goodness to his church. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Did you find that? To the angel of the church and lay it to see or write the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this, I know your deeds. They are neither cold nor hot, and I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out or spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise for you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I say to anoint your eyes so that you may see. For those who I love, I I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. For he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, for he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to his churches. Let's just trace uh, the life of the church for just a moment. And then I want to share with you five things from this passage of Scripture. If you were to go back in your Bible, you don't have to, but the, the inception or the establishment of the church is given to us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 18, uh, where the Bible says, uh, Jesus speaking to the Apostle Peter, and Jesus said, uh, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So God is going to build his church. Jesus is going to build his church. We fast forward, we go into the book of Acts, and we find the explosion of the church movement. And we find in the book of Acts that the Lord was adding to the church daily those that would be saved. And then you get about a third of the way in the book of Acts and it goes from adding to the church to God multiplying uh, in the church. And then you move over into the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is Paul's letter to the Roman church there and the Roman believers. And Paul elevates the sin of the people, but he also gives them the solution that is found 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be reminded of that passage of Scripture, and uh, we know Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8. We know Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And then we get to that great passage in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, where Paul said this, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what, church? Saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Paul was identifying and elevating the sin of the people, but he said the solution to your sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. So call upon the name of the Lord. Of the Lord. And then Paul writes to the letter uh, to the church of, of Corinth in First and Second Corinthians, and and Paul writes to a highly gifted church, but an internally troubled church. And he has much to say to that church. He talks about their immaturity. He talks about their their partiality. He talks about their immorality. And and Paul goes on and talks to, about the gospel to this church. And then you move over to the book of Galatians. And Paul is talking to the Galatian believers and t telling them and reminding them, you were grounded by the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, what has happened is that you're wandering away from the truth to another gospel. Paul writes a letter to the church at Ephesus, and he reminds them of the forgiveness of sin in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7 and the blessings of Almighty God in chapter number 1, verse, thir uh, verse 3 through 14. Then he writes a letter to the Philippian church as he makes his way on his missionary journeys. And the Philippian church is only four chapters long in that book in your Bible. And Paul talks about the joy of the Lord. And he says these words, Rejoice in the Lord always in church. And again I see rejoice. And then he writes to the Colossae church, to the church uh, of the Colossians, and, and he talks about the, the supremacy and the, and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about Christ being the head of the church. And then he writes to the Thessalonian believers in First and Second Thessalonians, and Paul reminds them of the great and the coming day of the Lord. You know that passage in First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 and following where Paul said, Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, and I don't want you to be uneducated about those who have fallen asleep. Because one day Jesus Christ is going to come back for his church. And then he writes the first to Timothy, the individuals, and he writes to Titus, young preacher boys, and he talks to them about what it means to be a leader in the church, and he encourages them to finish well and to finish strong. And then we get to this great book, the book of Revelation. You say, well, I'm scared. I'm, I'm afraid to read the book of Revelation. Can I tell you, dear friends, it's the, it's the message of hope. The book of Revelation is the greatest message of hope that can be discovered by a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So from this passage of Scripture this morning, I want to tell you about God's goodness to His church. Five things here number, this morning. Number one is this. You find in this passage of Scripture in verse 15 and 16, you find the cold and the carnal. The cold and the carnal. Notice what he says again in verse 15. I, Jesus, know your deeds. I know your works. And Jesus says, I know that you are neither cold or hot. But I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you or spit you out of my mouth. Now, the topic here is that they are lukewarm. Now, we know the analogy. I don't have time to get into all of that, but if you take a cold glass of water, that is soothing, uh, encouraging to your thirst. And if you take a hot bath, that is soothing and encouraging uh, to your body. But if you take a warm bath or a lukewarm bath or you drink a lukewarm glass of water, that's something that doesn't taste good and doesn't feel good uh, on your body. And Paul, uh, Jesus is saying in this passage of Scripture, in some churches are cold and carnal people. Now, what is a carnal person? Well, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul addresses the issue of carnality. The word carnal means uh, fleshy. It means in the flesh. It means acting selfishly. If you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you find out that there were discrepancy, there were divisions among them. You get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you discover that Paul is saying, I can't speak to you as mature people. I can only speak to you as babes in Christ. And then you get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. You're all still with me this morning? You get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and Paul says that you're immature. And what you're doing is you are 
being partial. You're saying some say I'm going I'm to follow the preacher of Pilate. Some say I'm going to follow the preacher Paul. Some say I'm going to follow the preacher, uh, the apostle Peter. And then some of you are so pious that you're going to say, well, I'm only going to always follow uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus is saying in this passage of Scripture, there are some people in every church that are cold and carnal. Does that offend you, dear friends? You may be here today and be cold and carnal. You say, well, what does that mean? It means Jesus is saying it means that you are lukewarm. Now, Teresa and I used to bowl quite a bit. Well, and uh, um, we used to bowl on a Tuesday night mixed league down in Mooresville, Indiana. Uh, you, it means nothing to you. Is the name of the bowling alley. It was a little 12-alley bowling alley. It's called Big M Bowl uh, down in Mooresville. So she bowled with me on Tuesday nights. I bowled with my brother and my dad on Monday nights and Thursday nights. We bowled in tournaments on Saturdays and Sunday afternoons. Can I get an amen to that? We, we, we enjoyed bowling. Listen, when we jump in and we do something, we do it. It's what we do. Well, we would bowl in this mixed league, and we bowled with my mom and dad on this mixed league on Tuesday nights, and, and this is the honest truth. We had a lady that was in that league, on that league. Uh, she never cracked a smile. She got a strike, she never smiled. She got a spare, she never, never smiled. She got a miss, she never smiled. And we called her Stone Face. Can I get an amen? I mean, that's just what people call her Stone Face. She would never smile at anything. Well, what is a lukewarm person? What, what is a lukewarm person? Let me give you this on the, on the screen here because I want you to be understand. First of all, a lukewarm person is an indifferent person. Well, what does that mean? That means that you really don't care about anyone else. You only care about yourself. You're indifferent. You don't care if somebody else is struggling or sick or anything like that. You're just an indifferent person. It's an impassive person. An impassive person is like what I mentioned in the stone face. No emotion. Care less. I don't care what they do, what they go through. You may even have the, uh, the, attitude of the, uh, uh, the attitude about a person, well, you know, they deserve what was coming to them. No emotion. A lukewarm person is an indifferent person, an impassive person. And don't, don't be offended, this is just a strong biblical word. But they're also an ignorant person. You say, well, what is an ignorant person? What is the definition of that? What that means is a lukewarm person is not, listen, not mindful of the will of God. They are not listening to the Word of God. They are not seeking out the Word of God. They are not being sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit of God. And they are an ignorant person. You said, well, that's a strong word. Well, listen to your friends. What it is, it's, it's like people that get on a, a one of those merry-go-round things, and they get on at one place, they spin around all day long, and they end up getting off the same place, and they accomplish absolutely nothing. Now, that is an ignorant person, meaning they are not mindful of the will of God. Listen to me, dear friends. You ever been in a church that's been cold? Now, I'm not talking about the air conditioning being on. I mean, you walk in and it's like an icebox. No friendship, no fellowship, nobody's smiling, nobody's welcoming you. A cold church. How many of you want to join that church today? None of you. Well, Jesus says here, you're not cold. The second thing I'll call your attention to is that there are some people in the church that are hot. And I, the word I gave with that is they are cooking. Uh, notice what happens here in verse 15 and 16. Uh, Jesus said, you're neither cold or hot. He said, I wish that you were either one of those two. I wish that you were hot or I wish that you were cold. I wish that you were on fire for God. Uh, everybody look up here just a moment. Have you ever been around someone who has just recently accepted Christ as a personal Savior and Lord. I mean, somebody that just gets saved, somebody just walks the aisle, somebody that comes up and bows their heart, confesses their sin, repents of their sin, and they are freed in Christ, and they come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever been around somebody like that? I mean, they are on fire for Christ. It, a light has been lit underneath of them, and they are not ashamed to tell anybody about what happened to their life. I got saved got born again, whatever you want to say, and they go out in the community and they tell people about Jesus Christ. Do they make mistakes? They make a ton of mistakes. But I'd rather have somebody on fire for Jesus making a few mistakes than a cold and indifferent person. What does it mean to be on fire for God? Well, the problem with that is this. These people who come to faith in Christ, and you've heard me say this before, they're on fire for the Lord, but what happens is this. They look at the way that we live, and in about six months, they backslide to where we are. Amen? 
What does it mean to be on fire for the Lord? Here's some words. You're walking with Christ. You're living for Christ. You're speaking the word of God. You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You're serving in his church. You are following uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are Christ-like. You are being molded into the image of God. You are being 100% uh, uh, like or obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go back just a second, look in verse 15 and 16. He says that you're cold or carnal or also or either you are cooking. We go back to this carnality issue. And when Jesus said in verse 16, he said, I will spew you or spit you out of my mouth. That is strong language. Now, why would Jesus say that? The reason why he's saying that is in the emotional side of that, what Jesus is saying when he looks at this church and he looks at churches today that are not mindful of the will of God and they are lukewarm, what he's saying is when I look at that church, it's nauseating to me. When I look at that church, it makes me sick. When I look at that church, it is a pitiful situation. That is not the church that I am growing. That is not the church that I am working in. It is a pitiful situation. Matter of fact, he even gives the, uh, the words that go along with that. In verse 17, he said, you are poor, you are wretched, you are blind, you are naked. Everybody listen up for just a moment. Who are the people that are in this church that are cold? Or that, I'm sorry, that are lukewarm? I want to tell you who they are. They are unconverted people who are pretending to be a Christian. Jesus said, I wish that you were cold and indifferent. I wish that you were hot. But since you are lukewarm, you are proving that you are not a believer in Christ. You are unconverted and pretending to be a Christian. So he says here, I wish that you were cold uh, or carnal. And then he says, I wish that you were hot. Here's a third word. Everybody with me? Say amen. Look at verse number 19. Then he says, encouraging uh, the word confessional. Notice what he says in verse 19. Those who I love, I reprove. And I discipline, therefore be zealous, and do what, church? Repent. That's a strong word. That's a word we don't hear much in churches today. To repent. But repent of what? I notice what it, uh, it's on the screen here. Three things I want to give you. Number one, you ought to repent of your attitude. You say, well, where do you see that? Notice what he says in verse number 17. You ought to repent of your attitude, first of all, because he says, you say that I'm rich and wealthy. You ought to repent of your attitude. You look at what you have, you say, well, look, I've got cars, I've got houses, I've got money in the bank, I've got all those things. Well, you ought to repent of that attitude. You say, well, why? Look what I did. Look what I gleaned. Look what I gained. Just like the man in, in the, the gospel account that says, I'm going to look at all my barns. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear them down. I'm going to build bigger barns. And then Jesus responds and saying, you fool, your soul is going to be required of you this very night. And we've got people in churches today. And they say, we don't need the Lord because I'm rich. I'm wealthy. Look what I have done. But, dear friends, can I tell you something? You don't have what you have without God. You don't have your health without God. You don't have your money without God. You don't have your job without God. You don't have your retirement without God. You, don't, you say, now, wait a minute. I disagree with you. We can have a debate all day long. Let's do it after church. But you will never convince this preacher that what you have is from you. It all comes from a holy God. He said he reigns it on the rich and he reigns it on the, on, on the just and the unjust. But listen, dear friends, everything that you have, you hang, have from the Lord. We need to repent of our attitude. Number two, we need to repent of our apathy. It's there in verse number 17 as well. He says, I'm rich and you become wealthy. And here's the apathy. I don't need anything. I don't need anything of the Lord. I don't need his church, I don't need his people, I don't need his fellowship, I don't need the blessings of the church, I don't really need any of those things. But dear friends, let me tell you, you need everything that God has because the Bible says without him you could do nothing, but with him all things are possible. Amen? So we not only need to repent of our attitude, repent of our apathy, but notice also we need to repent of our actions. Notice what he says in verse 19, those who I, he word, phrase, I, what, love. I reprove them. I rebuke them. I uh, discipline them. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, repentance is the remedy. Repentance is the solution. Repentance is the action that we need to take today. 
Repentance is when we give an invitation that we call people to come to the altar and repent of their sin and the way that they've been living and turn their life over to a right relationship with God. Repentance is what God demands from us. It is what you need. It's what I need. Repentance is what the church needs to do today. Matter of fact, in verse number 19, if I understand the scripture correctly, repentance is commanded from God. Look at verse 19 again. Everybody still with me? Therefore, those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Therefore, be zealous. Here's the command. And repent. That is the action. That is the command. But repentance is also limited. If you go back in chapter 2 and verse 21, I'll be real quick with this. In chapter 2 and verse 21, Jesus is writing to the church of Thyatira in chapter uh, 2 and verse 18. And then in verse 18, he said, The Son of God who has eyes like flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze says this, I know your work, I know your deeds. And then he says in verse 21 of chapter 2, I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality confessional dear friends listen today is the time to repent it is god's timing god gives us time in order to do that so you're either cold or you're hot cooking uh then there is confessional number four i want you to look in verse number 20 is here's the famous passage a familiar passage you can either be closed up as well uh, closed up as well thank you for that jesus says here behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, everybody listen up for just a moment. I know if you've been in church for any length of time that you've heard this verse of Scripture quoted during an invitation asking for the lost to come to salvation in Christ, that God is knocking at the door of your heart wanting to come in and save you as a believer in Christ. Now, I'm not necessarily totally against that. But if we're going to look at Scripture correctly, Jesus is not talking to the lost here. Jesus is talking to his church. And Jesus is saying here to his church, you all have done something. You, you all have done something. You all have taken an action, and it, it has caused another reaction to what is taking place. You say, well, what is the action? The action is that they have closed God out. The reaction to that is that God, through Christ, is standing on the outside of that church door and is knocking at the door of that church. Can't you just see that today in so many churches? Church, are you with me? Can't you see it even in uh, our churches today, maybe even in our church through the time? Jesus is standing outside the door of the church, an unrepentant church, an unregenerate church. I got to thinking about that, and I thought about, well, I wonder what the Lord would say today to our church and our churches today. And I just jotted a few things down. You all pushed me out of the church. You all thought that you knew better how to run a church than I did. Uh, you, all, you all picked your own leaders that you wanted, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Uh, you guys had, a, you had an itch, and you needed somebody to scratch that itch, and you need somebody to tickle your ear. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but wanting to have their ears tickled. You wanted to, everybody to go to the Target and buy you a Tickle Me Elmo doll. Can I get a witness here this morning? And you wanted that doll to stand next to you and say the things that you wanted to say. And, and they're going to accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to miss. Here's what Paul is saying to the church. He's saying, y'all got an itch in your ear. You want somebody to scratch that itch. You want somebody to tickle that itch. He says, so you've turned away from the truth. Listen, when you turn away from something, you've got to turn to something. Are you still with me? When you turn away from the truth, you've got to turn to something. Paul said, you've turned from the truth, and now you've turned to a myth. You've turned to the tr from the truth. Listen, and not only have you turned from the truth, you've turned from the teachers that are teaching the truth. You say, well, where is that in that passage of Scripture? Because Paul says, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Now, dear friends... We are living in those days today. You picked your own leaders. 
You ran things the way that you wanted to run, Jesus may have said. You've all had your little clicks and you ran around trying to get people on your side of things. Jesus said, you shut me out. And Jesus is saying, and once you shut me out, I'm outside the door and I'm not trying to force my way in. But what I am doing is I'm knocking on the door, listen, and I'm wanting someone, anyone, in the church that could hear the knocking of the door of the Savior to come and open the door so that I can have full reign of that church again. Many churches today are going nowhere. And they're on a decline because people, sinful men, think that they know better than God, perfect man, how to run the church. Ew. 2019, 4,500 churches closed their doors. 2021, over 5,000 churches closed their doors. Many churches today are five years or less from closing their doors. They're dying out. You know why? Because they think they know how to run the church better than God does. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he said, uh, as far as I know, I'm the one building my church. He said, it's my church. I'm the head of the church. I'm the one who designed the church. I'm the one who gifted the church. I'm the one that's coming back from the church. I'm the one that holds the keys to the kingdom for the church. I'm the one that has all authority in heaven and on earth. Two real quick stories for you. I, I know of a pastor that uh, in, in the Midwest part of the country, um, he went to this church. This church had three remaining members. Three remaining members. And he went to the church, he said, I'd be glad to help you. And he said, I'll become your pastor if you let me to let me be your pastor. And he said, I'll do the best I can to help you the best I can. You don't even have to pay me a dime. Southside, don't do that. Okay? And his pastor said, I'm going to come for free. I just want to come and I want to help you. My wife and I, we're going to move to the area. We're going to invest our lives in it. They had three remaining members. So they said, okay, fine, we'll let you come. First Sunday that he came, he preached, and one of those three left. Three years later, that church is running about 50 or 60. It's a thriving, becoming a healthy congregation, and God is blessing that work. And by the way, they're still not paying their preacher. Several years ago, there was a decent-sized church in Indianapolis on the east side of Indianapolis <clears throat> and uh, a black congregation, and a young preacher boy got called to that church, and when he went to that church, the church had about 300 people. And he preached a few weeks at that church. And then on, a, on sometime during the week, a handful of ladies, the dear sweet lady, showed up in his office one day and uh, said to him, and I'm going to paraphrase this, said, Pastor, now uh, we know that you're a young preacher and, and we want to love on you, but we want to let you know some of the things that you've been doing, just some things that we just don't do around here. And, and what you're trying to do, we just don't do things like that around here. And so this young preacher just had a good, strong backbone in, in his body. And he said, well, I tell you what, he said, uh, you all may have extended a call to me, he said, but the Holy Spirit of God is the one who called me to this church. And he said, I'm following the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. He said, I'm going to lead this church where the Holy Spirit of God is going to lead me. So they parted ways, and, and the ladies left the office, and he went about his way. The next Sunday, those handful of ladies affected the lives of about 50 people. So the next Sunday, instead of having 300 people in church, they only had 250 people in church. Well, what happened? Did that church die? No. The church didn't die. They've got about 25,000 members today in three different locations. And here's what I want. Here, I'm going to tell you what this guy does. It'd be pretty cool. So they have three campuses. They have the main campus. So he preaches at the main campus at 8 o'clock or 8.30. Then he goes to the northwest campus and preaches there. And then he leaves there and he goes to the northeast campus and preaches there. And then he comes back to the near southeast campus campus and preaches the 1230 service there so what he does is when he's done preaching and they give the invitation one of his other staff gets up and leaves the invitation and he gets in a car by police escort danny and is escorted to the next location that's what i'm that's what i'm sort of getting to here I, I, that y'all need to look at doing that for me you know so and then when he's done there, he goes to the next location, and he goes there to the next location. He comes back to the last location, 
And you say, well, why in the world is he doing that? What my point is simply this, dear friends. If we allow man to run the church, then man is going to run the church. But if we allow God to run the church, then God is going to run the church. And God's goodness and his blessings are going to come on that church. Jesus said, I'm the one who paid for the sin of mankind. I'm the one that God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It is his church. Listen, because if it was our church, we would mess it up. Amen? So well, I'm leaving here because I'm going to go to a perfect church. Bad English. There ain't no perfect church out there. There's only a perfect Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. The last thing in his passage of Scripture is this, and that is the word conscience. Look at verse 22. Verse 21 says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my, right thro on my throne, and that's all also as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And here it is, verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Seven times in seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, to all these seven cities, Jesus writes a letter. Two of those churches, he commends them because they were being faithful because they were going through tribulation. Five of those churches Jesus condemned. He said, I've given you time to repent. Here's what I've got against you. Here's your time to repent. If you repent, then here's the things that's going to come with that. But every seven churches, all seven churches, he ends with these words. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I was uh, reading this morning this passage of Scripture that I quoted for you just a little bit ago out of um, 2 Timothy. And um, have you ever been just reading Scripture, just sort of maybe your Sunday school teacher and you're, you're reading and you're reading over that verse to get ready for a Sunday school class or you're getting ready to teach a class on a Wednesday night, whatever it might be, and you know that's the passage for that lesson. And, and all of a sudden when you're rereading that passage of Scripture, it's almost like the Holy Spirit stopped you at that passage of Scripture and said, this is for you. And that's what happened to me this morning. This morning I was rereading that passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy where it says there's time going to come where they're not going to put up sound doctrine, all things go along with that. And it came to this passage of Scripture. Paul says to Timothy, but you. He sort of stops what he's saying and turns to Timothy and says, but you, Timothy, be sober in all things. And here's what the Lord spoke to me about. Endure hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Fulfill your ministry. Do what God has called you to do. Amen? And don't worry about what anyone else says. And I got to thinking about that. And, man, I'd love to see our church run 500, 1,000, whatever it might be. But that may not be the plan of God. Uh, what he has for Southside Baptist Church. I don't know if he's going to bust the doors open and the walls open when we move to the new location. I don't know. He may do an increase. He may do a decrease. I don't know. He may run us down to 65 people. I don't know the answer to that either. But all I do know is this. We must fulfill the ministry that God has blessed us with and reach people that God has called us to reach. Whether we have three people or whether we have 300 people, God has been good to his church. Amen? So, are you cold? Are you cooking? Are you ready to confess? Are you closed up? Or are you conscious? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not the building, but to you. And to me. So what's he saying to you today? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Dear God, thank you for your goodness. As we heard in the song that James sang just a little bit ago, your goodness is running over. Wow. It's, it's running over. And you are such a good, good God. And your church is your church. And your people are your people. 
But, Father, we may not be where we ought to be in relationship with you. If there's anyone here today that has yet to come to Christ, I pray today is that day of salvation. If there is a person here that is indifferent in a relationship with God, Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart. Draw them with your love. For if they are one of your children, your word says that you will discipline us. You will reprove us. You will correct us. But, Lord, you also love us, and we're grateful for that. Lord, would you draw men and women, boys and girls, to yourself today as we sing a simple song of invitation, Lord, that the Savior is waiting. If those those who will come, Lord, I pray that they would come. I pray that they would come as we stand, as we stand to our feet in just a moment, Lord, on the very first verse, that verse word that we sing, that they would come. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand if you need the to come. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your Don't leave here until you do business with the Lord today. You know, you could be sitting right in a seat right here and just be pondering what the Lord spoke to your heart about, or you can go in one of our rooms, and we'd be glad to sit down and talk with you about what God's doing in your life. But don't leave. Don't go out that door and give the devil victory. Give the victory to Jesus today. Amen? Amen. Because time is running short. Let's pray together. Father, if we praise you, we love you. We celebrate Jesus and everything that he's done for us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.